Thank you, uh, Samuel. Before I begin, I will share my screen and make sure that everything works on your end. So you should see my screen now. If there's any problems, you can just uh, let me know. So hello again, everybody, and thank you uh, for this invitation uh, for the Grand Conference of the AQPC. I'm very honored to be among you today and sharing my research and talk a little bit more about this question of transition and what success looks like in upper education, higher education. So the presentation uh, today uh, is uh, called... Uh, as Mr. Bernard said, a concerted approach of uh, success in uh, higher education, analysis of diversity of success of the students and power of action of institutions and teaching personnel. So the idea today is really to concentrate on this question of what success looks like. But this question of success, we have to look at diversity and the different roles uh, that uh, the different institutions and stakeholders and students play throughout this transition. So I have a presentation in four phases. First, we will talk about this notion of success and uh, what we talk about, how we define uh, success in uh, higher education. We're going to talk about this definition and the issues connected to it and uh, to uh, uh, then explore the posture we're going to adopt for success in higher education. Second phase, the second part, we will talk about questions of diversity. So uh, really um, around this aspect of diversity uh, and different diversities, plural, where diversities uh, are situated uh, in uh, success uh, in higher education. And then we will look at the relative importance of this diversity with regards to the transition process towards higher education. So the third part, we will look at a question of action points. So this uh, uh, actions that people can take, that uh, stakeholders can take to support the uh, students in this transition to higher education in their path to success. And we'll also ask questions of uh, the of a time-based nature when we will, uh, when we need to act in the first year specifically, which is a, a more more sensitive year for transition into higher education, of course. So uh, I, uh, if I have time, we will give you a conclusion that will look at the take home messages, the takeaways of uh, the presentation. And then we will look at the four main points of the presentation again. And I will uh, present uh, some ideas that will help us uh, if you are interested in exploring this uh, subject further and that will feed into the Q&A at the end. So oh, I hope you will appreciate your experience today and that uh, the presentation will uh, be possible in the 75 minutes. I hope uh, to not go on uh, too long and leave some time for questions and comments at the end. So we will begin now with the first point, which is the issues around success. So the issues around uh, success really from the point of view uh, of a researcher in Belgium, like me in a European context. So when we talk about success in this context, what kind of issues are we facing? And so what are we responding to? So uh, issues that are uh, more of a global nature, but that is very uh, important in Europe, that is uh, this very high ambition to be able uh, to uh, have a success in higher education and a massive uh, success and participation of the students in our system. So we have in this uh, uh, order of thinking, uh, some aims to have a higher proportion of students that would be uh, graduates with uh, the idea of having a higher rate of diploma and uh, a, a process that is more equitable, that opens it up to more people and less influenced by the social and economic situation of the students and uh, favorizes diversity. So in our approach, we uh, will look at the uh, different horizontal ob uh, uh, objectives, this uh, uh, question of access and be able to have 50% uh, of the students uh, succeed in higher education and that, that the system is more democratic. So to uh, encompass these objectives, you're gonna, the objective uh, cur currently uh, is around success in higher upper education is to have more than 50% 
of the students uh, with uh, different profiles uh, be able to graduate without their baggage interfering with their success. So this objective is to have a massive, uh, more massive success and uh, different kinds of uh, uh, profiles. Uh, so this presentation seeks to uh, suggest uh, different paths to reach this objective. For this uh, objective, one element that is important uh, to put forward is that uh, this issue is relatively complex for institutions, uh, in Europe anyway, but I think uh, also uh, in your neck of the woods uh, also, you have uh, these uh, issues. So today we are facing a tension, an interplay between offer and uh, uh, supply and demand and a demultiplied uh, offer. More uh, students that have access to upper education, higher education with a heterogeneity, with more uh, a diversity of uh, students with very diverse profiles who have access to higher education. But there's also a pressure on uh, the offer side of things. So to be able to manage more and more students, but also in uh, keeping... Uh, uh, expectations high, good infrastructure, uh, quality studies, quality of services, and access to information, and all of that uh, considering the uh, specific needs of diverse groups. So more uh, pressure on the offer side and more uh, requests on the demand side. And so for us today, we are in a context where the performance with regards to this uh, objective on a 2030 horizon to have more students succeed from more uh, diverse profiles, this performance is judged unsatisfactory. We haven't reached our objectives yet. Why? Well, because we have a success rate, a diploma rate that is considered weak in our specific context in my context here in Belgium, we are at um, a, um, rate of abandonment, which is 60% the first year. So 60% of the students that uh, go into higher education will either fail and uh, uh, interrupt their studies or uh, uh, go on for a while and then end up leaving. So we have a, a, a degree of difficulty this first year. Why? Because uh, in uh, uh, Belgium, we are in an open system. So which means that a young person that gets into higher education can choose uh, the uh, subject without description without restrictions uh, except uh, medicine and engineering but for all other subjects they can choose any uh, uh, course of study they like as long as uh, they have finished uh, the uh, previous phases of their education so one element that is important with regards to this performance is we are in uh, an unequal situation with chances of success meaning that the socio-economic and cultural and economic situation of these students remain an important factor on chances of success of the uh, students in higher education that's the belgian context i uh, would like to specify that it's not unique to us in belgium our uh, neighbors in france have the same issues with the same difficulties and we can see these difficulties in other countries like Germany or the Netherlands, for example. So we are uh, right now um, in a context where the performance is not satisfactory, and it's not just in Belgium. So with regards to this issue, it's important to understand why. So we uh, um, were exploring this issue beyond uh, uh, just wanting um, a big part of the population to reach uh, success. So uh, uh, there are consequences financially for their uh, society. So in Belgium, the cost of study is not expensive for the student, which means that there's a subsidy from the state uh, between uh, 7,786 uh, and 6,291 euros per year per student. And we have a very high rate of failure. So it has a very significant cost relative to the failure rate, which is attributable to this difficulty in transition to higher education. So there's a lot of money that is spent that is not well invested, uh, well, not as good as it could be anyway in uh, upper uh, higher education. So it's not the only consequence, it's not the only caveat that we have, 
with uh, this uh, relatively high uh, rate of failure, but we have consequences that are on the psychological level as well for the students, for young people, to loss of confidence, uh, um, some uh, mental health issues that can affect uh, the students short term, long term and medium term as well, uh, with regards to their future uh, success in education and the professional life. So there's a social interplay, a social tension here uh, around this transition towards higher education and to uh, look at these problems of lack of success or failure in uh, uh, higher education. So the one thing that makes this into a paradoxical situation is we have limited means in uh, uh, Belgium and in France as well with regards to this question. So um, the budget that is uh, allotted to higher education in our country is pretty stable, whereas the population is increasing, the students are increasing uh, at a high rate for the last 20 years. So we have a reduction of budget per student and the uh, expenditures per students that are possible have gone down by about 20% uh, in the last 20 years. So we have more and more students and more and more um, expectations uh, as well and more challenges to uh, the uh, situation we'd like to see. Uh, so we're in a situation now where we're trying to do more with less and trying to maybe do as well with less. And so the thinking here uh, around the efficacy of how we will uh, uh, work on uh, what we define as success. So one way to position ourselves with regards to this question to, to be uh, is to try and increase the budget for uh, education and higher education specifically. But here, the posture that I will take in this presentation today it was more about thinking how we can do things with the tools that we have and increase the efficiency and efficacy of this transition and how uh, we deal with it in different situations and different institutions. So today we are in uh, a situation where we have to increase our efficiency in higher education. And this presentation will try to bring you progressively to ask the questions and look at uh, the issues around uh, success in higher education. So I hope everything is clear. We're gonna take a five second break. So. Uh, you can digest uh, what I've said and we can uh, then carry on. So what I was saying here is the objective is to uh, maximize the efficacy of accompaniment of success to success. So the objective is to think about how to maximize this accompaniment, how to maximize this approach towards success and transition to higher education. The first thing that can be important with maximizing the efficacy and efficiency of our tools and accompaniment is to really look at the definition of success. So some uh, researchers say that the notions of success and failure are not well defined uh, in the research and are used uh, more on a practical aspect to define success in uh, higher education. So if you, uh, and I uh, invite you to go and explore this for yourself, to discuss with some of your colleagues uh, on uh, what they define as success, and you will see that this idea of success is very big and very diverse and complex. And uh, uh, we connect it to a lot of different concepts. So we have a definition of success that is implicit and also diverse, uh, different points of view. So with different individuals. So we, if we want to put an action in place to uh, support uh, higher education that is uh, uh, really intentional and efficient. If we all have an implicit and diverse vision of the same objective, it's complicated, difficult to uh, be on the same page with regards to this objective because it's not explicit and very diverse. So one of the elements that we are uh, in agreement on is we're going to measure success as a rate of uh, diploma uh, at the end of the year or a, uh, the rate of uh, uh, how many people stay in school. So uh, if we look at these indicators that are very wide, that uh, capture a very wide image of uh, the success rate, for example, in Quebec or UCAM, or these are indicators that are very uh, wide in scope. And that gives us the impression that success is kind of a global rate, something very stable and uh, 
very difficult to, to move the needle. So we have this impression that when we work on a success on this uh, these numbers, the rate of uh, success of abandonment of uh, diplomas, and so it gives us the impression that the actions we take day to day will not be effective in moving the needle. So how do we change these numbers globally or increase the success rate of our students? with more targeted actions and uh, support and accompaniment and supporting their uh, studying the methodology of study or managing anxiety. It can be very complicated to imagine that we can have a direct impact on all these aspects. So another uh, thing that uh, jumps out uh, from the literature is that when we measure the success, we can question the timing. Is it the end of the year or the number of diplomas at the end of the studies? Or is there a way to uh, have different uh, um, phases of measurement at, at different times to have a better proximal view of success? So the other thing we see in the literature is this rate of success or a diploma diplomation. Uh, varies uh, by institution, but also programs of study and the location. And so we have uh, the impression that the success rate in general, we imagine that it's a one size fits all and it's uh, the same everywhere in different contexts where it's not the case. There are success rates that are much better in certain contexts and certain places than others. So a situation where there are different periods of time or different phases where the measuring success is not clear and we can look at differences of uh, success that can coexist and, uh, and so, uh, all of this uh, is animated by a very uh, diversified uh, view and measurement of success. So that can cause a lot of divergence, difficulty in putting in place efficacious tools and uh, actions. So we can look at the definition of success, what would be our success uh, definition, and we can concentrate on a, an administrative definition that we can call academic, uh, really. So the success as the satisfaction of a student of the criteria related to the curses. So like data driven uh, with the educational context of the educational institution or the different uh, uh, stakeholders or teachers in the program. So the definition of Roland and Al, et al and the uh, satisfaction, uh, the uh, success is the satisfaction of the minimal criteria to master uh, uh, skills to continue the curses. But that uh, really, uh, Dar it, uh, skews our vision of the, uh, uh, different qualitative and, and uh, aspects, different skills and knowledge that has been developed, the quality of uh, these skills and competencies, and it, uh, the notion of uh, personal development or vocational development that say that success is not just a question of satisfying criteria uh, of success, but also finding your own way and thriving. Uh, personally and vocationally as a future professional and future citizen that is active in society. So in this idea uh, uh, where we don't where we uh, we don't consider subjective success, Said uh, 2019, the student himself comes with their own objectives and their own definition of success and that the objective of success don't always uh, fall in line with uh, the uh, uh, criteria for success after one year or after three years for a diploma. They can also consider uh, things like success where the student considers a success that is not a success. But if the student uh, 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 goes through one year from a defeat and the student is from a, a unfavorable condition to develop his skills and knowledge that will better prepare him to continue his studies, uh, uh, even though administratively he will be considered a failure. So all of this demonstrates that limiting the notion of success to an administrative context that uh, would be measured only by a rate of success or failure or a rate of diplomation is very uh, limiting in terms of what's happening really and uh, the uh, different definitions of success in higher education. So that's why with certain colleagues uh, in France, we tend to propose a vision that is pluridimensional, multifaceted for success. 
uh, so tri-dimensional really. So we can say that success is a multi-dimensional uh, concept, a three-dimensional concept presented here that can uh, uh, include academic uh, success, the minimum criteria for success academic, uh, uh, academically, but also educational success to be able to evolve in uh, mastery and knowledge and acquisition of skills related to higher education, a more macro view, and the success of the student personally for the student to reach a stability and thriving in the higher educational system. So this uh, perspective uh, would allow a clarification uh, and a better view of the objective and the approach uh, that we want to uh, build success on. So what is our uh, approach to success? Do we, what we put in place uh, is to favorize academic success or educational success, or uh, success at the student level for the students themselves. So how do we position ourselves with these three dimensions? So I insist on the fact that the indicators to measure these three uh, different aspects of success are not the same. One element that I can propose uh, with regards to these elements is the success uh, of the students, the third uh, facet uh, that is more uh, malleable, the confidence of the students to reach certain objectives uh, and the context of the, the student thriving in higher education. So it doesn't come from nowhere. Um, it comes uh, from uh, research that has been done uh, by Schreiner in 2010 that talks about student thriving. So it's a vision of success that is more wide ranging. And the interest of this vision of success, uh, according to Schreiner, would be that uh, the student has a wider view of success, but that allows also to center uh, uh, success on modular aspects that have a huge potential to develop uh, tools with the students to uh, so to affect uh, the student to improve the uh, thriving of the student can be easy to measure can be very motivating for the teams because we really see an impact if we uh, uh, use tools to measure thriving and we see that the students are thriving and we see the impacts uh, directly uh, which is not the case in academic uh, uh, success. So is it to act on a student thriving, to have uh, infinite uh, positive effects on the other two facets of uh, success, uh, edu educational and academic. So in uh, this um, version of uh, uh, success and this vision of success, we have five facets of uh, uh, five aspects, the personal aspects. So the student uh, succeeds and thrives uh, personally, reaches their personal objectives for the student. The vocational aspects or the capacity of the student to stay engaged in higher education. The uh, 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 vocational aspect, sorry, that uh, the uh, uh, aspect of the student to, to uh, develop uh, their choice of studies and understand how their studies will help them to transition to the professional world. The psycho-effective part, which covers the uh, aspects of success to find uh, your place and thrive in uh, the environment they find themselves in, and the social aspect as well, which is the capacity of building a support uh, uh, system that will, uh, that will help the student to thrive and support them in their journey. So what is the interest to hear of these different aspects uh, of success? Well, it offers clear and justifiable objectives to uh, actions uh, in the uh, real time on the ground. So it allows us to diagnose and put actions in place and gives us indicators that are more sensitive to the impact of uh, support and accompaniment. So we can associate a number of indicators to all these aspects that will allow us to develop actions that would be targeted uh, to uh, the situation of the student, particularly effective for the student. So uh, this publication is is not available yet. It is uh, not yet published. We'll have to wait a little while to be able to read all the research with regards to this aspect of success. So uh, you have access to most of uh, the studies I've uh, cited here. So to conclude this first point, we look at this question of posture. So positioning. So to uh, improve the efficiency of support for success today, one of the first elements is to make the vision very explicit, to vulgarize it. So to ask this question, and I'm asking you this question, I can't see you, but I can't see your reactions, but I will ask the question here, what are the dimensions of success that you want to prioritize and why? 
So what uh, is at the heart of your definition of success? How do you make it more explicit? So in helping you to make it more explicit, more vul uh, to vulgarize it, to uh, give a uh, uh, so to be able to see if you're really aligned between actions that uh, and vision of success that you are trying to support. So that will allow us to maybe put in place uh, and identify um, certain uh, dissonances and uh, frustrations where there's a dichotomy there where I, uh, I'm doing what I can to support success, but I feel frustrated with regards to this idea of a certain inefficiency and lack of efficiency of my actions. So maybe your actions may be judged uh, effective or not because it, they're not aligned with the right indicators. So the question uh, that we should ask here is, how do the actions undertaken today, how in my institution, uh, how do they support my vision of success? Are we in alignment or not? So with a caveat here that um, a, focus that is more too centered on one aspect, a unidimensional uh, aspect uh, focus can be a, a negative for other aspects of uh, education. So if we look at only one aspect or one uh, uh, one aspect of this vision, we can neglect others. So it'd be important to have a balanced vision of the different facets of success. Our objective can be maybe to increase the diploma level, uh, but uh, the uh, students have to feel comfortable and uh, thrive and uh, try to reach uh, their objectives uh, in all of this. So that's my first point. So if you have any questions, don't hesitate. You can put them in the chat and we'll answer them at the end. And uh, I uh, will give five seconds here so that you can think about these points and uh, before we carry on to the second part, which will talk about this question of diversity. So uh, we're going to look at diversity and how to manage uh, these different diversities uh, uh, with regards to success. I hope I'm not going too fast, and I hope that everything is clear and digestible for you, and that I'm not uh, flooding you with too much information. Okay. So uh, questions of diversity, uh, the questions that were central to my work for many years. Uh, with the first question uh, that uh, really came out of my work is to say, is it really important? How important it is to consider diversity in the student population when uh, we uh, think about success? So to do that, I uh, have done many studies, uh, one here on uh, 2,178 students, uh, uh, first year students, and there are others here uh, at the bottom that you can uh, look at. When we look at diversity that we can consider, uh, uh, diversity that is centered on four variables that are judged in the literature as being particularly important to help the transition to higher education. So these four variables are the uh, uh, scholastic past or the educational history of the student, how good was their education before they came into higher education? The second one is the related to the Belgian system, the open system and the process of uh, choosing a course of study. So how, to what extent the student has uh, the choice and how uh, much they think about their choice in uh, their program of study. So in the Belgian context, there's not a lot of constraints and the student uh, can uh, uh, choose any uh, program or course of study they wish without really thinking if they want. So uh, that's an important aspect. There's also the socioeconomic uh, part, the, the socioeconomic factors. So for now, the students uh, uh, are... Uh, it's there's an effect of the socioeconomic part of it and also the um social and, e and personal development the uh, emotional development the confidence that the student has in their capacity to succeed so uh, personal development and thriving so the uh in um the literature, we see that this is the most important part. The most important determinant is the psychological state uh, that uh, determines the success of the students, the most important one. So in the analysis uh, of this that has been done, um, 
uh, for those who like questions of methodology, we've done uh, uh, different analogies, transition analysis and uh, uh, historical analysis and uh, systemic analysis, different analysis that has been proposed with different uh, uh, literature, different studies, quantitative analysis as well. Uh, of the results, but these analysis have demonstrated that at entry, there are six profiles that uh, are distinguishable, that are distinct. And so these six profiles uh, are there and they're not equal in terms of success when we try to measure uh, success uh, academically, but they're not equal in their chances of success. So what was very interesting with these results is that they're uh, not influenced by the same factors. So the process of success may be uh, completely uh, uh, the same. So um, a few details here uh, and some visual representation So uh, of the results. So you can see here, there are six profiles. Each uh, one of these columns is a profile, each one of these rows, and uh, there are weaknesses and strengths for all of them at the outset that we can see in the green columns and the red columns. So if we take the first line is the at-risk profile, as you can see in the first column here. Uh, so in the green squares, there's uh, only one there's profile, uh, uh, presents some weaknesses. So a weaker uh, history, uh, educational history, less thinking, socioeconomically defavorized, and a weaker uh, self-confidence and uh, uh, psychological strength than others. So uh, at risk students. So without great surprise, these students have less chances of success in higher education. But what uh, the analysis shows is that what will particularly affect these students in their process uh, of transition is two things. First, the motivational factor. So the fact that they are motivated uh, and develop strong motivation um, for their education to develop this strong sense of motivation. And what is particularly uh, difficult is the perception of competition. So they perceive themselves to be in an environment that is very competitive and they will have a tendency to disengage and be discouraged, lose motivation that was essential to their success and uh, essentially fail. Um, so another profile that um, I'm not going to go through all of them because we don't have time, but another one that could be interesting is the number four, the fourth line, democratized, democratized profile. What is that? It's a mixed profile that presents some strength and a weakness as well, main strength and a main weakness. It's a profile of a student that has a scholastic past that is positive, that have done well historically in school, uh, but what characterizes them is they have uh, disadvantages of a socio-ecological, uh, economic nature, a socio-economic nature that is unfavorable to them. So they come from disadvantaged situation where none of their parents have gone to higher education and uh, they are in an unfavorable socio-economic situation as well. So these students, despite their success in the past, they still um, are at risk, uh, significant risk of failure, uh, higher than average. However, it, it's not about uh, motivation or competition that will be important uh, in their process of transition. It's uh, some; These are things that don't have much impact on this profile. What will be central to their success is uh, the support system. So the fact that they can find in uh, their network people who will support them socially, emotionally, accompany them throughout this process of transition. So all of this to demonstrate that we have different profiles with different chances of success, and they are not equal. They have different weaknesses and strengths. So to answer the first question, to what level diversity is important in success, this diversity seems primordial in the sense that it has a direct impact on academic success, but it will also have effects on the tools and the obstacles that uh, face us in terms of success. So to have a one size fits all a kind of system or a tools will not be successful. So one other thing that we worked on is to concentrate on the fact that diversity is uh, 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 seen in a defective way. This diversity is not a weakness. There are not just groups that are at risk. 
and that these uh, at-risk groups, even them, have resources that uh, are more than uh, expected, that more than people think. So we have uh, done this with two research, uh, uh, some research that has done. The first one is to compare physical handicap, the students that are at risk of uh, failure with more traditional uh, students without handicap. So uh, without uh, uh, these incapacities. So what we uh, compared both groups, how they went through the first year of uh, higher education, what were the main obstacles that they faced in regards to success so with uh, what's interesting with this research is that the students uh, will meet the same obstacles later on in their process and have the same uh, vision pretty much of this first year of transition to higher education except that without attributing uh, these difficulties well they vary between both groups so uh, the students with a an incapacity or a handicap they uh, say the students say we have difficulties but given our uh, scholastic past that was complicated we are used to these difficulties we uh, with all these difficulties we've been through uh, given our past we have a, a real knowledge of our weaknesses and strengths and we can manage these uh, obstacles we have learned to do that and we see these difficulties as a challenge a uh, uh, to uh, uh, help us uh, mo be motivated to uh, succeed and uh, thrive, but also we feel supported by the university with all the accommodations in place. So we are in a situation where it's much better than before. So uh, higher education is much better adapted to our success than it was in the past and what we've seen in the past. So traditional students are uh, destabilized with these new difficulties. These are students that didn't have a lot of difficulties in the past and had a relatively easy time. And here they're discovering in a new environment their strengths and weaknesses. They're still discovering that and learning how to uh, react to uh, uh, obstacles. So they uh, really... Uh, it's not really a question of th thriving really personally, but uh, more of a social comparison and comparing themselves to others and to see that university uh, perceives uh, uh, is perceived as being hostile, a hostile environment. So uh, it's a bit counterintuitive. The students that are in an incapacity situation or a handicap situation has a have a better profile in terms of the principles of success, despite uh, the uh, uh, obstacles that they've had that to deal with in the past and continue to deal with. So the same thing for adult uh, students. They are students that uh, are uh, qualified uh, as at risk. The studies show that these students that start, uh, these adults that start uh, their studies again, they face difficulties, difficulties in uh, uh, work life or school life balance, personal life and education, family life, etc. Difficulties uh, in learning uh, about the research and scientific approach and difficulty in managing the pressure related to being a student. And it's a very fast pace where they have a lot of things to accomplish and uh, a lot of work to do. So also they have less difficulty at communicating with, with the teachers and they have less difficulty understanding why they're there and what motivates them. So the profiles that are qualified uh, at risk present uh, some strengths and uh, unexpected resources. So it would uh, be a trap to uh, look at this uh, in a ne more negative way. We'll try to target the at-risk profiles and work on those. So here there's a logic of uh, a resource based and different uh, uh, tools for different uh, people situations. So I hope uh, uh, everything uh, is going well on your end and I'm not going too fast. I'm just going to take a second here to uh, uh, let you breathe and go to the next slide. So what I'm uh, saying here is that diversity is important uh, and it cannot only be qualified by the different profiles, but uh, diversity of strengths and weaknesses and uh, uh, sensitivity to the transition to higher education. So what my results and my analysis uh, have shown and uh, have investigated is the diversity beyond just the person, because we talk about this diversity in the student population, but that's not the only thing that changes. It's not just this diversity that can have an effect on the process of adaptation to higher education. So it was investigated with a few studies, the program of study and how it affects success. Is there a difference 
in the process of success for students between different courses of study or programs of study? Or can we consider that there's a universal process that works for everybody? So we've done this in different universities, Catholic University of Louvain. We've done the study here in my university. 15% of the success of students will be determined by their program. So uh, it is determined by their program. So it uh, uh, a success level that varies between 30 and 50%, depending on the program. So that means that the question of, of, uh, of success is not the same intensity with different programs of study in our university. So in imagining that we can extrapolate that to other universities as well. So what was interesting in uh, this uh, study as well, beyond just attest to the fact that there's a real variation of the question of success and the rate of success in different programs, as we've discovered that the determinants of success don't have the same effect from program to program. So the factors that are generally associated to success in the literature don't have the same effects uh, with different programs. For example, if, uh, to go to class and not miss any classes has a very significant and positive effect on success in sciences in uh, our study. However, it has a null effect or insignificant effect on the students in law. For example, in uh, law and studying law, attending all classes will not have an effect either way on success of students. So having a paid job to be able to pay for your studies has a negative effect on success of students in medicine in medical school that have a, a very heavy program. However, in psychology, which is uh, uh, easier to balance uh, uh, a job, doesn't have an effect either way. Uh, uh, having a job doesn't have an effect uh, either way for studying psychology, for example. So it shows that diversity here uh, in terms of the different programs uh, counts and has a significant effect. So uh, from our uh, research, what we put in place, it would be interesting to consider three levels of diversity to be able to have a vision of our approach to success. So the micro level that uh, covers this diversity in the student population, this diversity of students in terms of uh, uh, history, baggage, uh, lifestyle, different learning styles, uh, specific needs, etc. A uh, medium uh, range diversity, this medium view of diversity, which is a diversity in the programs of study. What are the specificities of my program and what do I have to consider depending on my program to support the student? And finally, a macro view of uh, uh, success that allows us to look at the, the different aspects of institutions and uh, establishments and at the national level as well. So uh, how do we look at success in Quebec in an institu in institution like Université du Québec uh, will uh, uh, bring different particularities that have to be considered to be able to propose uh, means of action, support and accompaniment that will be the most efficient and efficacious possible. We are right now working with German colleagues uh, and Swiss uh, colleagues on this analysis of these different levels. Uh, I have certain elements here that you can find in these slides, but I'm not gonna get into detail because of time limitations, but for now, the literature is not uh, available yet. So there are certain elements here that you can see in the slide, but you'll have to wait uh, for the uh, uh, research to be published. So to conclude on this second point, that diversity is not the be all and end all. So how can we characterize diversity uh, where it counts and where it doesn't? It can be complicated because we see that there's a lot of diversity that uh, has an, a significant effect. Uh, different students uh, in uh, uh, different situations in terms of uh, uh, educational past, in terms of uh, uh, life uh, journey, in terms of uh, personal development, and try to categorize this diversity is pretty complicated. And so that's why we uh, I like this idea of uh, uh, maybe this diversity is the rule and not the exception. And it would be interesting maybe not to categorize it, but understand that it exists and understand how we can benefit uh, from different resources uh, with these different uh, student profiles. And we see as well that there's a contextual diversity, a diversity in the student population. It could be interesting here to uh, 
consider that when we try to uh, take actions to support success, it'd be interesting to uh, consider the context and uh, consider the uh, target audience and the context in which we are positioned. So a question that I invite you to explore is to ask, what are the specific conditions of my context and my student population? What are the specific aspects that I should consider and be attentive to uh, in these different uh, specificities, if you will? So we talk a lot about diversity, but another way to work on this transition, even if diversity is very important, is also to consider what are the elements that will be universal in nature? It's all not everything is different. There are some universal aspects. There are a lot of common elements and uh, uh, some common challenges to, to the transition that will allow us to have a baseline, a foundation that we can uh, evolve with regards to different specific situations, specificities uh, that uh, we will look at in a few moments. So I will uh, give you 10 seconds to catch your breath here to uh, digest uh, all of this. I will invite you also uh, to ask questions and make comments uh, in uh, the chat or the Q&A tab so that uh, uh, we capture everything and uh, we'll be able to uh, go to the next part of the presentation. There we go. So I hope that you're still following and that I'm not going too fast and everything is clear. I know I'm giving you a lot of information, but uh, I hope that uh, you can pull out enough information that is relevant, that uh, uh, brings forward important questions and help you to find answers, which will bring more questions and help you to explore further and really think about these questions of uh, success in higher education. So now the third and last part of this presentation which is acting uh, for success. So we're going to put aside this uh, question of diversity for now. And if we want to act and uh, propose different actions uh, towards success and act in a more transverse way. Uh, so if we wanna think about this in a more transversal way on uh, what actions we can take, what tools we can use, how we can act and when we can act. So we're gonna look at the many points here that come out of my research and other uh, research that has been done to answer these questions. So the first point is how we act, what actions we take is about the, resp the responsibility we have with regards to success and who should take actions towards success. We talk a lot about the students and their purview and means to act, but there are certain actions uh, like Chamonix and Gwada says that there's a necessity today if we want to improve the efficiency of our approach towards research to uh, success is to redistribute uh, uh, and to look at uh, the way we define success in different ways. So uh, usually we have a, a tendency to try and promote success and reinforcing the power of action of the student and give the uh, student more purview and they are the main actors in their success to give them more tools to success uh, and more tools for action to maximize their chances of success. That's a good idea, of course, but it can also be interesting to complement that or to enrich that in adding an important element towards success is that Success can also uh, be in adjusting the context of the uh, uh, environment to reduce the obstacles in higher education towards success. So a good way to work on success is to reduce the obstacles to adaptation for these students. So it's in this uh, perspective that we can see uh, the work uh, that have been done from Trotwein and Boss in Germany that talks about the obstacles to transition to higher education. And the big difficulty for students is to be able to uh, deal with these obstacles. And a way to for institutions to work on these aspects of success is to think about how they can reduce these obstacles and avoid obstacles that are too large and uh, hinder transition. So I'm going to let you think about these obstacles in, in a more general way and what Tonvai and Bos uh, propose and what has been replicated in Belgium and France and some of my research with colleagues is there are four types of obstacles, personal obstacles. So all the obstacles that are related uh, 
to students being able to manage their studies, their day-to-day -day life, to deal with the pressures related to education, uh, obstacles related to uh, uh, a difficult scientific approach or uh, unrealistic educa uh, educational expectations or not to understand the, uh, why they're studying this or that and the, why they're in this program and what the, it all means and the difficulty of the student really to be able to integrate into a new environment, a new climate, and a positive uh, environment that uh, will build positive uh, social networks and relationships. The organizational obstacles are this capacity to understand the conditions and the environment to adapt uh, to the regulations and rules and the social aspect, uh, uh, organizational uh, aspects as well. So you can imagine that... Uh, without working necessarily on the student, but working on the context uh, on the environment, we can reduce these obstacles so that uh, the students can have an easier time and moving forward and have an easier transition. So this is the first thing is to reduce obstacles that are of an environmental nature. So uh, also uh, behind all of this, it would be important to continue to reinforce the purview, the uh, means of action for the student. So how can we do that in uh, building their skills? So there's research that has been done on the different ways of working on accompanying students that can be uh, more efficacious, more efficient. So the uh, ad hoc accompaniment to propose uh, workshops for these students or work on uh, uh, maybe uh, uh, note taking, uh, managing work life or student life balance. And so uh, it uh, uh, limited in uh, efficiency. It has uh, some uh, uh, shortcomings. It can work very well at the beginning of the process, but it loses efficiency uh, uh, in time. Uh, uh, through the process, uh, and so the uh, if efficacy is limited. The second one is personalized accompaniment. So to be able to take the student under your wing and to propose an accompaniment that meets their needs specifically. So we see in the literature that it has uh, a, a high successor, but it's very expensive depending on the number of students that are present. Another way is to accompany the student uh, that is very strong in the literature right now is integrated accompaniment integrated to the uh, uh, activities of education. So we're not going to try to accompany the student outside of the classroom, but we're going to try to accompany the student within the walls of the classroom in uh, integrating our thinking with the students. So the accompaniment to success is not something externalized, but something internalized directly in the classroom setting. And the first results that we see with uh, these analysis shows that it's a very cost-effective and very effective way of working on reinforcing the actions of the student the student can take towards their own success. So there's some studies that I've done have demonstrated that if we want to know if these different actions in accompanying students, uh, it's important to know and document their effects. So we shouldn't forget that there are, uh, despite all the intentions and good intentions of the world uh, we it's not always uh, successful and we have to look at different aspects to make sure that the accompaniment works for uh, the different types of students and for the students specifically so another way to act on uh, the students success and uh, favorize their success is to support them in working on the classroom context we can accompany the student directly in the classroom and that's true but we can also think about accompanying the student by the teacher and working on the context of the class. So we made the, we've done many studies that tend to demonstrate that there was 25% of the success of students that would be determined by the classroom context and uh, the uh, teacher and their habits and how they do things would have uh, an effect that is very determinant on the success of students uh, 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 through the characteristics of the class. Uh, so the uh, size of the classroom and the climate of performance that they don't really have an effect on, but the uh, opportunities for exercise and opportunities for success that can be very negative for the student. The possibility of the student to have uh, feedback and to be able to uh, try and test certain things and practice certain things, but also a pedagogical activation, different modules that will allow the student to be at the center of the learning process. Then there's the attitude as the teacher, 
the posturing of the teacher will be very important for the success of the student, the way he behaves towards the student, their eloquence, their uh, 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 verbiosity, their uh, uh, capacity to present things to pique the interest of the students, but also is there a positive consideration for the students? This allow, allow the students to try things, to do uh, things by uh, trial and error, to let them learn, let them make mistakes and fail forward. So this question of practice, uh, this question of practicing uh, pedagogy comes out of my research, is the reinforcing of the structure and the uh, uh, different uh, um, importance we give to different aspects. So how does this class help us to better understand the objectives we're trying to reach and how much the, the teacher uh, explains and uh, gives a sense or a meaning to the objectives related to the class for the students? So through all this research uh, done by one of my doctoral students, we uh, have a theoretical model, Just Teach is the name of the uh, model. So it's a practical model for teachers that look at the different pedagogical practices and isolation in the classroom. So there are four key questions and four dimensions of practice for the students to favorize success. And these dimensions, these aspects would be first, things that we can question as uh, how and to what extent can I favorize interest, attention, and uh, active involvement of the students? To what uh, measure? To what uh, measure I do that? How can I give a context of support and uh, 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 supporting uh, my students and being there for them? How can I uh, give and produce? Uh, elements that are necessary for understanding the class and what we're trying to do for everybody, all the students. And also, to what extent do I push my students and bring them to think in depth and to acquire skills and a high level understanding of what we're trying to accomplish with this class? So these are the four elements we can think about as a teacher in higher education. And also, we are reinforcing this with many quantitative studies, the effects of these different categories and their observed effects on different dimensions of the process towards success for our students. So the socio-effective uh, aspect to have uh, a uh, uh, positive environment and to support the students socio-effectively, uh, uh, psychologically, uh, emotionally, and uh, so that the student has uh, an interest uh, for the class and higher education, but also it will affect the interest for the class in general, supporting the student, reinforcing their interest for the material. But also uh, uh, the, uh, the other part of it is a negative uh, uh, environment, an uh, environment where there's a lot of perceived competition and that will push the student away and disengage them from uh, important uh, reflections and thinking and has a negative effect on their performance uh, and affect their performance directly. Concerning the structure of teaching to make sure that the course is structured in a way that the students can digest and understand, support participation during class time so the students can have a positive effect on the classroom and uh, to have a direct engagement in the, the uh, class and favorize positive emotions and favorizing uh, deep level teaching and in-depth understanding of uh, the uh, material. Material. The uh, classroom management to be able to uh, support uh, the engagement and uh, interest of the students and uh, support uh, attendance in the classroom. When we support the students and they feel supported and uh, interested in the class, they are more interested, of, of course, and also are more present uh, in class and uh, uh, miss less classes. The cognitive part of it, the cognitive activation to push the students, to bring them to think about complex aspects during the class, to support participation and increase performance. So they participate more and they perform at a higher level. However, uh, beware, it may diminish positive emotion and increase negative emotion if taken too far. So these are first year students. Remember that the fact that uh, we try to go too far too fast and to go at uh, in depth too quickly can have um, a uh, perceived as a threat to their well-being and they're more stressed and it's more difficult for them to uh, have uh, positive emotions and be encouraged so they uh, feel uncomfortable with regards to uh, the deep level of thinking we are asking of them. So it um, 
this is all about uh, practice in the classroom. If you want to go further, we have a publication called Active Pedagogy in Superior Education that allows, um, it's about 300 pages, that allows us to discover uh, the, the different innovations on a pedagogical level, that allows us to think about these key aspects and uh, to have different tools to activate uh, these uh, different uh, strategies for a pedagogy in the classroom. So I will let you catch your breath for a second here. And uh, before we cover the last part of my presentation, which is the not how to act only, but when, uh, when uh, to uh, um, pose certain actions. So I hope all of you are ready. Uh, so when uh, we want to act, when we want to take certain actions, we haven't talked about the time aspect yet. Here I'm going to talk about the first year of upper education and this transition to the higher educational system. So when we uh, look at the theory of transition and certain models of transition, we can see that a transition is a process that involves different steps, different levels that will systematically be composed uh, uh, of different elements and different uh, traps, different uh, caveats. So they transition already starts to happen before they start a higher education, before they start so the uh, preparation phase that will be very important, that will affect uh, the adaptation, that will affect uh, the stability, the stabilization of the transition. So in talking about transition and preparation to transition, uh, the preparation in the literature it will uh, permit in the uh, context of Belgium an open uh, system to uh, determine that 25 percent of the probabilities of students uh, success is due to preparation pre-studies preparation to think about expectations to be realistic in our expectations and have clear and well-defined expectations uh, of uh, 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 the classes and the program and to have a, a positive uh, view and uh, positive attitude to think about uh, developing skills but also developing knowledge and transverse skills and uh, to have a high level of prerequisite skills and preparation so there are certain authors that uh, tend to say that without managing preparation correctly accompanying to success uh, would only uh, be part of the solution and uh, and an action that is semi efficient uh, and uh, so then this question so the question of preparation a uh, pre-study preparation is very important so a particular uh, a a question that is important is the uh, aspect of accompanying the students and meeting with them that is not uh, really covered in the, uh, as much in the literature, but the first weeks, the first days in higher education uh, that will have a determining effect on the uh, success of students. So to meet them where they are, if you will. So uh, quasi-experimental analysis that has showed the snowball effect that we can have in working on small aspects of success right from the outset of higher education. So why, why are the first days very important and primordial really for future uh, success for this process of transition to higher education? Well, in these first days, the student arrives into uh, this process with a malleable uh, view, and they have uh, a, con a conception that is malleable, that is not set in stone yet. And so when they're in this new context in the first few days, they will adjust their vision, they will uh, adjust their attitude and their behavior regarding the uh, new environment, and depending on the context they are in. So uh, because humans don't like instability, one of the first things that the student will do is to try to find some stability and to uh, have a framework that is stable in terms of their behavior and uh, their uh, uh, um, conception of uh, education. So if we act positively in the first few days, we can have a snowball effect. And if we uh, act in a negative way in the first weeks as well with uh, too uh, many negative uh, feelings, we can uh, have a, a we can uh, have a vicious cycle that would have bad effects. So in a longitudinal study that we've done over two years with students of the first year that we uh, followed in the first two years, that what the students say when we question them on uh, their experience is, what is important to uh, reaching success in higher education? Well, the students say that one of the elements that will be, not just one element that is important, sorry, it's a progressive uh, transition that necessitates a, a equilibrium that is very delicate between determinants of success uh, from the beginning, from the outset, to have a, a solid start and to maintain this momentum from the start. So what the students say is 
if this balance, this delicate balance cannot be maintained and there's imbalance there, these students would tend towards uh, uh, burnout or abandonment of studies. So students that were very engaged, too much maybe into their studies from the beginning and that have unrealistic expectations and that led to burnout because they don't manage their resources and they are uh, become disengaged and uh, where they had a profile that was very positive in the beginning. So uh, conversely, students that are uh, engaged later on, that are not as engaged in the beginning, and that really had difficulty in catching up in all these uh, uh, problems that they had in the past and characterized by a, a bad start because they don't have the tools in the first weeks, the student was saying, for example, I'm not motivated. As soon as we try to accomplish something and as soon as we have some uh, failures, the failures accumulate and at the end we know that we uh, can't catch up and it's too late and we will fail the exam. So that shows that it's uh, very important to act from the beginning to maintain a positive momentum and positive actions from the outset. So the last point that comes out of all of this is a first evaluation. And our analysis shows uh, that the phase of evaluation, the first tests or exams will be very important and particularly sensitive to the student to uh, be uh, a moment where we pay particular attention to uh, the student's education. So we see that for certain students, they have a real awareness that they're not up to speed and that their capacities are not there yet and uh, that they uh, look at their uh, habits and things that are not there yet. But the students that uh, feel that they're very strong may be disillusioned if uh, they don't reach the level that they expected of themselves, they become disengaged, discouraged, and uh, have trouble managing the transition. So this first evaluation seems like a very important and relevant point of action on these questions of success. So that uh, is the end of what I wanted to present today. I hope it was not too much information. I hope I didn't flood you with information. I see that there's seven minutes uh, for my conclusion. So, and then we can um, take some questions. So in conclusion, I uh, would like to cover the uh, points that I hope you will take away from my presentation, the key elements. So the first key element of the presentation is today, in our context anyway, um, we are in a kind of paradox with political considerations that are very important for superior education, very uh, ambitious, but with resources that have not evolved. And so we are in a situation where we could do better, we have to do better with less, which is complicated, and that, uh, that forces us to work on efficacy and efficiency. The second element would be to this necessity to have an expl explanation that is very clear of our approach to success and uh, to uh, uh, look at the educational resources to improve the efficiency of the approaches we have in place. The third point is this question of diversity. And when we look at the diversity and uh, to uh, measure and count the diversity from the outset, that's very important for success. But that this diversity should not be seen only as a resource uh, and a way to identify uh, people that are at risk, but also the diversity is a resource and that can, uh, uh, the strengths of some can account and help with difficulties of others. So this is not only centered on the student when we talk about these diversity, diversities really, different diversities in different contexts. So it's important to consider a uh, an aspect that is well anchored. What is the action? What is the context? And how can I put in place a uh, action that adapts to the public, to the uh, target audience? So uh, the uh, acting on uh, success in a transverse way. So acting towards success, to have an action that is anchored on into the context, to be able to look at how the environment uh, uh, can uh, have some negativities and how can I favorize uh, positive aspects of the environment for uh, superior education. And also it's important to be attentive to uh, uh, transition points, to tipping points. Transition will be important, but there's this uh, uh, meeting the student where they are and first uh, evaluations that are very important. We also will see that accompaniment seems to be the more effective way and accompaniment that integrates the uh, teachers and to allow us to have a more concerted approach that uh, with my colleagues, Isabel Bruno, an ecosystem to accompany students for success that uh, combines pedagogical and uh, uh, other aspects of uh, support towards success. But all of this 
the question we ask is, what are the limitations and how can we reinforce the efficiency and efficacy of our approach? But we can also look at all these aspects and saying, is this strengthening of the efficiency of the approach will be sufficient to reach the new uh, uh, ambitions and new uh, 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 measures of success and spiritual so without uh, necessarily changing the framework of uh, financial investment uh, for superior education. So thank you for your time and attention today. And uh, before taking your questions, maybe take a moment to discuss uh, amongst yourselves if uh, there are many of you in the, uh, uh, the same room or maybe through the chat to note two elements that you uh, take away from this presentation and that uh, seem important to you. So there you go. I think we can take your questions now. And if you want to accompany us uh, in uh, our uh, thinking, we have a publication here, Transition to Superior Education, that uh, answers a lot of these questions and goes uh, deeper into what I've presented today. So thank you again. Uh, uh, did we keep time? Yes, absolutely. Uh, you've kept uh, time. Thank you, Michael Declair. We can now uh, take uh, questions. So we have many, but before getting to the questions, I... Uh, uh, People have said that it was very clear and a very good presentation. We have had many positive comments in the chat with regards to the clarity and relevance of the presentation. So it was very well received and people really appreciate it. Thank you. Well, you're welcome. We can now go to the first question. The first one is more a question of validating the understanding. Alexandre is wondering if he understood that success with the five different aspects and the fundamental effect of the student will have a consequence of improving ad academic and educational success. Yes, um, inevitably, the fact of working on student success uh, uh, will have an indirect effect on educational success and academic success. So the fact that we can work directly on uh, the engagement with the student and meeting them where they are and uh, to help them to reach their objectives and develop a strong intrinsic motivation to help them find their, their way personally and uh, personally uh, thriving in a uh, positive social situation. These are all aspects that usually are considered as the direct determinants of uh, student uh, success academically and educationally. So what I'm saying here uh, with regards to a student uh, success is the important thing is not necessarily to look at educational and academic, but to look at these five aspects directly in the actions undertaken already. By doing that, we work on other aspects of success as well. Excellent. Thank you. The next question, and um, uh, it's a very relevant question, Julien Martineau, who asks, you talk about personal accompaniment and the cost Yes, the approach is relevant, but we see the costs involved for institutions and for society um, in a context of developing AI. Um, is it can it be an avenue of a possible choice to use technology to personalize the approach? Is it possible short, medium term? Do you have an idea about this? Well, it's just a personal opinion, but uh, I think that yes, technology can be an element uh, that we can use uh, to the extent that for now in Belgium, for example, we are not thinking directly of how to work with AI, but we're thinking about a way to uh, propose an intermediary between a personalized accompaniment and an accompaniment that is non-personalized. So a kind of a midstream. In Belgium, we are trying to find accompanying methods that are transverse without really, well, without uh, addressing that directly to a specific public that uh, we would identify as having a need for this type of accompaniment. So that means that, for example, we'll put in place accompaniment uh, that uh, uh, helps them with methodology uh, that uh, uh, with students that uh, will uh, come to these workshops, essentially there are students that don't really need to be accompanied on these questions, but that uh, want to favorize their success that maybe haven't found their way in this accompaniment because it's not specifically suited to them exactly, but students that would need that more won't necessarily, maybe not 
what won't come to this kind of accompaniment that, that would be then at risk uh, to uh, regret that because they may need it later on. So for now, what we're doing is what we're thinking about is a possibility of being able to have a diagnostic follow up of these students and asking them to position themselves with regards to these different aspects of uh, success for the student and educational and academic success as well, to be able to follow them progressively through the first year and to see if certain students uh, from the beginning uh, uh, present some uh, difficulties or obstacles uh, that uh, appear progressively to be able to inform the uh, uh, pedagogical staff that could specifically then propose more personalized courses of action for groups of students that will have the same problems at the same time. So I think that in this framework, AI could be a great help to be able to analyze and manage a big group of students with specific needs to be able to do some triage there and uh, to maybe not full personalization because uh, I think there are some limitations there because of the relationship uh, that is complex between the people who accompany them. But to be able to have this semi-personalization of uh, actions towards success and better target our intervention to better target what we need to give them as far as tools and strategies. Excellent, thank you. I have a question from Louise Couteau that uh, uh, mentions the importance of preparation and onboarding uh, integration into the upper education and, and uh, identify uh, tipping points and or determining moments and what actions we should undertake with the new uh, people in higher education and students that don't know and uh, that uh, uh, don't know the uh, environment. And so it's a difficulty we have in our system as well uh, that uh, I don't really have a lot of answers yet um, because it's uh, one of the difficulties we have in our system as to uh, the responsibility of success in higher education is uh, rests on higher education, but not on uh, the institutions for uh, uh, previous mandatory education. So we have to work on this uh, these factors of success without uh, considering the preparation aspect. So what uh, we are doing now in Belgium is to propose tools for pre-diagnostic of people who want to get into higher education. So for right now, we're working on a toolbox uh, uh, online that uh, we propose for future students that get into higher education, that want to integrate higher education, to be able to position themselves with the different key elements of preparation, of pre-study preparation, to uh, uh, have a, a well-defined set of expectations with regards to higher education and uh, understanding of the different professional paths and uh, knowledge of themselves and their strengths and weaknesses and strong motivation to higher education and to develop skills and knowledge that are sufficient with regards to their uh, program of study. So all this allows the students that want to go into higher education to be able to um, have a pre-diagnostic, if you will, to before getting into higher education, to be able to find support, to build a support system so that they could be better prepared. It's pretty complicated once they're in the system to work on what was lacking. So it's better to do it beforehand and work on uh, the obstacles from the beginning before they get into the system. And so to what will be important is to uh, right from the outset, right from the work, first weeks of higher education, that will be a very determining time because uh, look at the different de deficits that could be problems later on and uh, accumulate uh, some uh, failures and we have to prevent that. So that's part of the difficulty. So we're trying here to work on elements that will allow us to um, act uh, upstream on the student and uh, to uh, uh, favorize accessibility and accessible tools and uh, right, ask the right questions with regards to preparation to be able to act uh, 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 quickly and uh, uh, to act proactively. It's very complicated. Yes, uh, if it wasn't, we wouldn't be here today. Uh, so uh, uh, the elements that we can work on, there's Louis Dugat who mentions that uh, the success is also the uh, classroom context. So we have to mention that as well and how to invest positively in the classroom and with all the restrictions that are there, the rules, the classroom size, the time given to education, all these constraints. How do we uh, navigate all these constraints to, uh, inv to uh, invest positively? Well, in the, the Just Teach project that I presented, 
uh, the way that we work with the classroom context is to really the way we work on analyzing this classroom context is by a systemic observation. So we got into the different context to be able to film what is happening in the classroom to uh, and to what uh, with um, a prior objective is that we will have a, a certain resistance and uh, some uh, um, resistance from certain students who would not accept that, that they would be filmed and to evaluate their pedagogical practices. So at the end of the day, that's not the reality at all. Most of them uh, have uh, accepted uh, uh, this favorably. And a lot of student, uh, teachers today that are, uh, I think, um, very much interested and, and uh, want to participate in uh, practice, uh, 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 practicing a, uh, an improvement and to reinforce the engagement and their classroom motivation and uh, to understand that uh, everybody is on the same page and understands what we're trying to do. So it's something we have to work on. We're still at the outset of the process. We're working on the possibility of maybe working with the, the teaching staff on these practices of analyzing the tools and the classroom to be able to work uh, with the uh, teachers to uh, show them what they do well and what they don't do as well and have an analysis on uh, what works and doesn't and give them a very personalized analysis of what they do and how they're how it works and how efficient it is so the pedagogical tools that could be very significant and can be very helpful to integrate these aspects uh, gradually so i think that it could be uh, a uh, good start to work with the uh, teaching staff. And the other part that could be interesting uh, is um, related to the first part of what I proposed is this question of clarification and to uh, vulgarize and uh, explain the objectives of success and what success looks like. Today, we have a problem with that as we don't uh, explicitly explain and don't make the con the conditions of success. Uh, uh, we don't explain them explicitly and are clearly enough. So, uh, so uh, they're not seen in the same way by all the different teachers and different stakeholders in the system uh, and the different programs. So that's, there's a problem. There's a divergence there. So in working upstream on uh, really making uh, success more explicit, what it looks like and uh, the different programs, uh, different facets of success and what they look like, we can have something very concrete upon which the student, the teachers can uh, position themselves and uh, build a foundation where there's a kind of uh, uh, momentum to go towards the same direction and have the same common set of uh, objectives of success for the students, we will progressively change uh, the frame of thinking uh, towards uh, success and the uh, student will progressively understand their role and their uh, involvement in this process and uh, reaching these common objectives. So these are the two ab objectives where we have to work with the teachers and uh, what is done in the classroom and work on uh, the program aspect of it to be able to come to uh, an explicit view of what we really want for the success of students and how it is exemplified concretely in the institutions, in the classroom and on the ground. So we, there's different ways of doing it, but that's uh, my answer for now. Excellent, thank you. One last question, which is a short one, but complex is how do we reduce the footprint of a performance? Bruno Gilbert asks this question. That's a very complex question. It's a very much a complex question, yes. Uh, so um, the problem is that it's really something that fundamentally will affect our conception and the values uh, that we ascribe to higher education and the view we have of the institutions and uh, uh, higher education in general. So, for example, uh, 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 in France, universities have the, this view of uh, uh, performance and this perception of performance from a very young age. And so it's very complicated to disengage the different aspects when we talk about when we talk about higher education, this logic of performance, because the students in their contact and their experience with a school, they had this relationship with education that is very performance based. So for them, they are very much uh, attached to this idea of performance. So 
if I want to show that I've done something good is to show that I perform better than others. And it's a, a long winded um, the work that we have to do. We don't want to denigrate performance and say that being uh, having high performance is negative, but uh, we can say that it doesn't have only positive aspects and trying to balance this view of performance. But there's also this whole question of learning and thriving and development the, where they have to position themselves. So uh, inevitably, it's a long winded and slow process with presentations like this one today with the fact that we have people that are present today that are interested and that are that think about these aspects and ask these questions we will progressively move forward on these aspects and it's a way to disseminate and to promote this multifaceted vision of performance that is not just performance based so uh, uh of education that is not just performance based so i don't want to be too utopian here and saying that there's one uh, magic pill that will allow us to solve all these problems uh i think it would be a process and that it will take years, but I think that we are on the right path and uh, where we are proposing different actions that are uh, predicated on different uh, aspects of success. And uh, so I think that we can, this is a time uh, right now, a, a tipping point where we can initiate a progressive change in perspective in education. Excellent. Thank you. Those are our questions for today. And I would like to thank you. I think uh, we've all started to think about these questions of different aspects of success today. So thank you uh, for uh, your presentation uh, directly from Belgium, uh, live from Belgium this morning with this wonderful and enriching presentation. And we hope that uh, uh, the uh, people here have really appreciated that you will share your PowerPoint. Yes, no problem. I will share my PowerPoint. It will be sent to all the participants. And so in closing, thank you to all of you for being with us today. Certain, uh, some, some uh, points of information for the next webinars, you will receive uh, a survey in a few minutes uh, to uh, give us some feedback on uh, the first uh, conference of the season. Please take the time to answer the survey. It really helps us uh, to uh, propose pose uh, uh, subjects of interest uh, to you as uh, we have today. So uh, also for Occupy Safe for the Fall, next week is the opening of our programming, our webinars that uh, uh, are online uh, the 26th of uh, September. Uh, we have somebody from Marianopolis College that talks about the integration of chat GPT uh, uh, for students to do homework. Uh, so if you want to have access to all the programming, it's online in the webinar section of our website. I also uh, um, want to talk about AI training. It's uh, very relevant right now. So a free training online that is accessible uh, uh, on the website for uh, of our website. It's a three hour training course that you can accomplish that you can complete with different modules on your own time. So talk about all the it talks about all the different impacts of AI for evaluation uh, uh, for the uh, pedagogical aspects of AI and how we can modify certain practices uh, uh, with regards to the effects of this technology in uh, uh, the world of teaching. And uh, last point is the communities of practice. So that also is uh, uh, becoming very active with four communities of practice that are accessible on different subjects that uh, will um, have online content uh, as well. So the next event is uh, intellectual is about intellectual integrity uh, with regards to generative AI or uh, the uh, First Nations aspect and decolonization aspect of education. We will have a first meeting around pedagogical uh, practices around these subjects. This is available in the uh, uh, community of practice of our website. So I wish you a great day. And I would like to thank our partners that allow us to present these activities for this season. So thank you, Mikael, for your presence. And thank you, everybody. 